Hello and welcome to Building Sustainability Podcast with me, your host, Jeffrey Hart, aka Jeffrey the Natural Builder. Every fortnight, join me as I talk to designers, builders, makers, dreamers and doers, exploring the wide world of sustainability in the built environment by talking to wonderful people who are doing excellent things. Hello and welcome to episode 69 of Building Sustainability. It is the 1st of February, 2022, and today we are talking to Danny and Zach from Tehran. These two are training AI robot drones to build cob houses. I could not pass up a conversation with these two. Before the podcast, a quick bit of news. Uh, I received a lovely message uh, from a Twitter user named S. S. It's spelled E-S. Uh, sorry, I don't know how that's pronounced. Uh, who very kindly shared me a blog post correcting some of what I said about the role of mass in a house. It is fascinating stuff. It's very, very uh, scientific. And I've read through it twice. And I still have lots of stupid questions to ask about it. I've added a link in the show notes for you to have a read. Uh, I'm not going to try and explain it here. I did start to, but... I think I would just make a mess of it. So rest assured, there will be an episode all about it coming up in the not too distant future. But thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, for correcting me. I think that's one of the great things about this podcast, that we open up a dialogue and we correct some uh, some misinformations. S actually stated that he started off life as a an earthship builder and, uh, and so was sort of fully into the idea of mass and held some of the the same opinions as me or maybe he was just saying that to make me feel better but uh yes good always learning always striving to make better buildings uh what else patrons uh this week we have jane merton has become a new patron of the podcast thank you so much jane and to all of the other patrons you rock my world uh if anyone else would like to support the podcast head to patreon.com forward slash building sustainability uh it genuinely makes a huge difference to have you support as producing this podcast really does take a lot of time uh, a quick little house update uh, i have got some lighting in uh, a couple of sets of lights have gone in i've wired them up i've got an outside light what a luxury and i have started my desk slash bookcase slash recording booth uh which I'm actually sat at now. It's a very, very kind of roughly thrown together arrangement. And of course, as soon as I made a flat surface, uh, I have covered it in all kinds of stuff, uh, which is going to make it very difficult to actually finish it. But I'm sure that will happen in due course. Um, Right then, the podcast. As always, there is a load of links in the show notes. Uh, If this is your first episode with us, then first of all, welcome I hope you enjoy the episode. Please do make sure you subscribe and check out the other episodes around natural materials and sustainable construction methods. I'm back at the end. Enjoy the episode. Uh, So Terran Robotics, our our, uh, mission is to radically reduce the cost of housing. Uh, and we're doing that uh, by automating uh, the construction of cob, cob homes, cob walls, uh, adobe walls, the d- d- different names for similar, similar kind of things. Uh, we typically call it adobe around here because people recognize that uh, more readily. Uh, but, but yeah, more technically, cob is, is the better, better term. Uh, and we're doing that with uh, autonomous drones. Uh, so these drones will pick up the cob, put it in place, uh, and then also shape the cob once it's in the, in the wall uh, and get it uh, yeah, in in the right in the right general general shape, similar similar to how a human would do it. Oh wow! I mean, that, when I heard about you guys, I think I found you on uh, on Instagram or something like that. But it was it was like what a what a juxtaposition between you know Cobb and then uh, I mean AI robotics uh, is like the other end of the the technological scale. Yeah, for um, sure. I guess I'm interested to sort of delve into sort of each end of that. Like why. So why let's say why cob? Let's start there. Yeah, I guess I guess the the place we started with uh, was uh, I I kind of had a had a background in 
uh, AI and robotics uh, and could see that there was uh, a lot of potential for bringing that to industry, to, uh, to construction. Uh, and, uh, and so we kind of looked at what are all the different kind of construction methods uh, that are out there, uh, which ones have the lowest material cost, because as we automate the construction process, the labor costs uh, go down. And so then the, the primary cost ends up being material cost. Uh, some of these construction methods uh, like stick frame, even if you were to fully automate it, uh, there's zero labor cost. You're still not going to ever beat the price of Adobe or Cobb just because the materials are, are too expensive. Uh, so, so kind of look at what are, what are all these different materials, uh, which ones are low cost uh, and which ones are amenable to, to automation. Uh, and that's that's kind of where we where led us to to Cobb. And we we had some some kind of uh, a small amount of experience and some friends who had done uh, similar kinds of things. So it wasn't completely out of the blue. Um, but but that was the direction that that brought us to to Cobb. Well, I mean, what were the sort of some of the other things you you sort of played with or thought? Yeah, about we were first? looking at uh, looking at stone. We were looking at uh, stick frame. Looking at uh, uh, straw bale. Uh, were some of the like brick, concrete, like three D printed concrete, uh, which which is uh, you know kind of gaining gaining uh, popularity or gaining at least uh, there's there's quite a few companies that are that are starting to do that now. Um, uh, yeah, so just try to look at you know red brick, uh, as many as many different possibilities as we could as we could find, uh, and yeah, just kind of chart out how much how much does it cost uh, to build a wall, you know, per square foot or whatever it is, uh, and um, and kind of just go through that entire process for for kind of each of the materials. Nice. I mean, it's it's fantastic. I mean, I think uh, cob building is is just a like a a joy. You know, it's often the materials like right there. It's really you're just sort of re re sculpting something that's that's on site already. Yep, um, yep. But it's always sort of you know the second half of that that uh, sentence is always, but it's a lot of work. <laughs> uh, you know, it's yep. You need you need a lot of people or it's, or a lot of time. Well, I think that's that's what kind of makes sense <clears throat> about about the process. Kind of, it, it, we didn't come at it from this direction exactly, but uh, one kind of intuition about it is that. In the past, uh, labor was a lot cheaper, right? It was like very expensive materials, like uh, milling, milling two by fours or two by sixes would be an extremely expensive process uh, 200 years ago, or 400 years ago. Um, and so back then, uh, the labor was cheap. And so that was a reasonable, I mean, relative to the materials, that was a, a very reasonable balance. Um, and so now with automation, we're kind of finding ourselves in that similar kind of balance where doing the work is actually the cheap part. Uh, so it's just, it, in, a, in, a, in a way, it is very similar to kind of going back in time. And uh, and you can treat your uh, your robots with the same uh, kind of respect that the, the workers were treated like right. back then. <laughs> 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 they can work hard. Yeah, they can they can definitely work hard. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, so what's uh, so it's sort of on the other side of your work, uh, you know, robotics and AI and. I, I'm I'm saying robotics and AI. I'm I'm conscious that, that might not be exactly what it is you're doing. Uh, that's a, that's a fair fair. Uh, yeah, that fair is. Decision. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just recently had a, a big sort of conversation with my dad where he was ranting about uh, the fact that AI doesn't exist because it's all programmed by humans. Therefore, there's no intelligence. I don't know. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. That's like a Christmas Day argument that we had. Yeah, that's not, that sounds right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I, mean, I think I think the thing that's that's uh, I mean the the intelligence, if if you want to call it that, I think intelligence is a is kind of a loaded word. So that that is it it uh, yeah, there's semantics in there, but but the uh, the part, for example, it, in what we're doing um, that uh, is is kind of more the intelligence of of uh, I don't know, say like an insect or like a, an animal or something like that is just that uh, instead of instead of Typical, typically in a robot, you would uh, build like a, a physical model, like a physics model in your computer of how the robot operates. Uh, you would make sure then that your actual robot uh, is exactly the same as in your simulator. Uh, so you would try to uh, make sure that, for example, none of the arms are bent, like uh, are flexible, or make sure all of the arms are uh, very stiff uh, so, that, uh, so that it kind of operates the same as in, in the uh, simulation. Uh, and which is a very expensive process. And then and then you would let the computer kind of run through the simulation and figure out how to control the real robot. Um, and the part that we're doing with AI uh, is to put sensors on the robot instead, let it kind of sense how different actions affect 
where it is uh, and, and kind of how fast it's moving and that kind of thing. Uh, and then learn on its own how to map from actions it takes to what, what actually ends up happening. Uh, and so then instead of, instead of having that computer model uh, that people have to create, uh, there's a, a kind of learned model, an internal model that it, it kind of learns on its own. And then, uh, and then we can still give it, uh, you know, give it goals and say like, the goal is for you to end up in this position uh, and not moving. Uh, and it kind of finds a path through that uh, uh, kind of model of itself uh, to, to how, how do I, what actions do I take in order to end up in that, in that goal state? Um, right. Because presumably, you know, if it's a, a drone building a house, uh, you know, there's going to be different uh, weather conditions to deal with. And right, right. It's, so it's got to figure out, you know, how do I position myself when it's windy? Yeah. So all that kind of stuff, it kind of figures out on its own. Um, I mean, there's still, we're still giving it the goals. Like, obviously it's not, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it, we're still we're still giving it the the goal of where to go and what steps to take and, and that kind of thing um but figuring out yeah how to how to handle wind how to handle different temperatures because the the air density changes with with humidity and, and temperature so that changes how the the drone flies uh, so there's all kinds of variables like that that we don't have to worry about um manually anyway it kind of we do have to train it so uh you know recently it got it got colder out uh, and the drone wasn't flying as well because we hadn't trained it in cold weather uh, yet. And so we trained it, we collected some data for, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour, uh, retrained it, and then it was flying stably again in the, in the cold weather. So uh, you know, it's that kind of thing that's, that's lets us move a lot faster than we would if, if we were having to do that all by hand. Yeah, that's, that's super cool. Do you imagine, however far in the future, that the whole process would just be you know, there would be houses being built completely autonomously. Yeah, I think I think uh, I mean completely autonomously is probably uh, know, that, that's probably a ways off. But I think I think you know eighty percent autonomously or ninety percent autonomously, something like that is is uh, much more feasible. Uh, I mean, there's certain things that that uh, humans are probably going to be you know, just better at. Uh, I don't know, like twisting twisting the wires. Uh, you know, when like doing electrical or something like that, like it's just, there's certain tasks that aren't that hard for people to do and are very hard for, for robots to do. Uh, so some stuff I think is probably going to remain, uh, you know, human, human labor, but yeah, I think ultimately a large percentage of it should, should be possible to, to automate. Wow. It's cool. I mean, one of the things that I imagine like a lot of people in the building industry, like would hear about what you're doing and just go like, ah, oh, no, that's, that's not going to happen. And then I just recently watched a, a documentary about um, sort of pioneers of electronic music and they were using like sine wave generators to make yep. you know, electronic noises. And all the people then were saying, oh, that's never going to catch on. This isn't this isn't music like the first film score that was made entirely electronically. They wouldn't let them write the music by it had to be like audiophonic arrangement by this. Right. Um, and then, you know, you fast forward, this was sort of in the 50s, and you fast forward to now and, you know, electronic, digitally created music is, is you know, the predominant uh, type. Right. Uh, and so I'm kind of, you know, I'm looking at yours and thinking like, wow, a few people at the moment might be going like, this is too far-fetched too, like never going to catch on. Yeah, so, so that's similar to how uh, with the current construction with stick frame and drywall and, uh, you know, the kind of bat insulation and all that very complex process, at least here in the, in the U S uh, it doesn't make sense to try to automate that, uh, you know, similar to in it, back then uh, the, the musicians weren't trying to use sine waves to make uh, you know, whatever guitar sound. I mean, people were doing, you know, inspired by guitars or inspired by yeah. the existing music, but, uh, but they're going in a different direction. Um, and so I think it's similar here. Like you're not going to take the exact same thing that was happening before and just make it electronic or, or automated or whatever, what have you. So, uh, it's gonna it's gonna look different. And where are you on this 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 sort of journey? Yeah, so so uh, I guess I can give kind of technical stuff, and then Dan, if you want to talk about the um, yeah more of the architectural and, and structural stuff. Sure. So uh, right now we're working on getting the drone to do the pick and place. So we're pretty close to that. Hopefully that'll be that'll be done soon. Um, uh, and then the next step of actually shaping it, uh, we're working right now on the the tools. We're kind of designing the tools to do that. Uh, you know, even even very simple things like. Uh, what surface do we put on the hammer that we use to shape the wall so that it doesn't just get all stuck up with the mud? Um, you know, it's a very sticky material. So 
uh, just even even that kind of thing. So just kind of figuring out how how we're going to do that uh, with hopefully building building a wall at least semi autonomously this summer. Fantastic. Yeah. That's uh, I can't wait to see that. That's uh, uh, I mean yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I'm just like my mind is just imagining it, and I'm like, yeah, really, that that will be cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to the time lapse. That's that's my uh, yeah. I'm super excited about that. We're, we're right there with you for being excited. Um, <laughs> On the building side, over the next few months, uh, we're trying to test a, a different system than the code for uh, seismic reinforcement for COM. So in the U.S., kind of the big problems are seismic reinforcement. We have a lot more uh, of that to to deal with than Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, and then our value, insulated value of the COM. Uh, we work with uh, Anthony Dente from the COB Institute, and he put out a uh, really they shared a, a paper on different weight cobs and what R value you can get from them. So in the spring, we'll be doing some testing of those different weights. Uh, with that testing, we'll we'll plug in the new lighter cob mixes, probably something like 70 pound when traditionally it's 110. Um, at a 70 pound cob, we get enough R value to meet code here in, in our region. Um, and in fact, across most, most of North America, um, we'll be taking that mix and the system we're designing for seismic and doing full scale wall testing, which is about eight feet by eight feet. Mm-hmm. Um, we push and pull on that and see where it breaks. And that gives us the numbers to see, you know, what's what's uh, reasonable for building across the U.S. Nice. I think, Danny, you you mentioned to me in an email, but uh, the, the Coboge project that's happening uh, at the moment over here. Yeah. So I was in university. Uh, I was in touch with them quite a bit uh, for, for uh, I guess, it was the last two years of school kind of just back and forth here and there when we have thoughts. We meet with um, uh, Steve Goodall uh, quite, you know, it's been probably six months since we met with him, but in school is is quite a little more frequently. Mm -hmm. I'm super excited about their system. It's one we've looked into. So they do a a load bearing cob on the uh, interior and then like a very lightweight cob on the exterior. Uh, I think there is promise for that as well. Um, It's hard here to source hemp. Uh, the cost okay. of the wall system gets out of control really quickly, whereas in France, kind of the leaders of hemp growing for hemp herd exist. Uh, the price point's much better. Right now, the premier builders in the U.S. that use hemp spray, for instance, ship mm-hmm. it from France. And that shipping really... cost and tariff cost and all those things make the, the wall assembly uh, you know, untenable here. That's crazy. I do dream of one day building one of their walls, yeah. hopefully in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. Uh, it's, I'm thinking if you build a, a more lightweight cob structure, then are you going to lose the, the load bearing ability for it? So, yeah, it, they're both on a curve. So as the lightweight increases, the PSI strength of the wall system decreases. Mm. Um, so it's finding that kind of sweet point where it's strong enough and insulative enough to be a reasonably thick wall. Um, if the projections hold up from what we have in the paper, it looks like we need something like 21 to 22 inch thick walls in our particular region. Um, we've been planning at 24 inches already. So we'll see if that, that shakes out. But um, there's a, in the current code in the U S which is, is not very old. Um, the earth uh, monolithic Adobe code is, is pretty recent, um, but they, had, they out they lay out the different PSI strength test modulus of rupture tests. And those are the things we'll start the spring with. So they'll go through those tests and then the full scale wall tests. And hopefully we have a product we could implement by, you know, June, July this year. Fantastic. I've, so I'm, I'm intrigued to know, like, what um, what are your backgrounds? How how do you come to to sort yeah. of create this this entity? My background is in construction. Um, I owned a, a company called Carpenter Al Tiny Homes, uh, which is natural materials, natural oils. Uh, I was building with that for a number of years, but the price point got, you know, to the point where I was just working for kind of high end clients and that wasn't exciting to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, I went back to school for my master's in architecture and then um, me and Zach started this company probably, I think it was the tail end of my first year because by my second year I was pitching classes in autonomous earth and construction and my thesis was on that topic. I left school once we got the National Science Foundation grant, but hopefully I return. But yeah, building for most of my adult life. We started out with um, a CB press together and that kind of, started the building process a yeah, cb was, press uh compressed earth block oh okay like a sinveram type thing yep. yeah 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 it makes like a six by six by 12 inch long block um mm-hmm. i think we had the third one produced in the midwest it was real finicky uh but <laughs> yeah it was from uh, open source ecology 
Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the open source, open source machine. Yeah. Um, your yeah, your work, uh, your tiny houses. I was having a peruse. They're they're very beautiful things. Oh, thank you. Yeah, occasionally yeah. I miss getting around and just playing with the wood all day. <laughs> but uh, the earth is a different beast, and uh, I'm glad we're figuring it out. Yeah, it's um, it's one that I, I mean, I I sort of straddle the the carpentry and earth builder uh, line, and going from one to the other, I'm always with the the timber. It's like it's not a nice hard edge, and I cut it, and it's exact, and it's you know, and it pleases like a certain part of my brain, but then. I go to Cobb and I'm like, but I can meld it and I can squish yeah. it and I can, you know, take bits and put put bits back. And uh, so, yeah, I think it's a nice place to be to have have both, you know, sort of disciplines. Um, and how about you, Zach? Uh, yeah, my background had mostly been in uh, kind of AI software. Uh, most recently, uh, it started doing more robotics, uh, doing simulated robotics research. Uh, so yeah, I, I was kind of coming from that direction. I've always been interested in, in natural building and, and, uh, uh, yeah, sustainability and th- these kinds of things. Like Danny was saying, we, uh, uh, start, started working on the compressed earth blocks. Uh, that was, that was like 10 years ago, something like 10 that. 10 or 12. Yeah. yeah. It's been a long time. Yeah. So we kind of had, that had always been kind of an interest, uh, but never been, uh, the main, the main, uh, you know, kind of employment. Uh, so, so this is kind of the first time to actually be doing it, doing that. I mean, how do you how do you decide that you want to do AI or robotics in the first place? <laughs> yeah, good question. I guess when I when I was younger, I was always interested in computers and technology, uh, and I, I you know was interested in, in AI, like getting just solving harder and harder problems, and like just seeing seeing how like the first time you write a program and it surprises you, uh, but in like a good way, like not like surprise, like it didn't work. Uh, surprise, <laughs> like it came yeah. up with a solution that I wouldn't have thought of. Um, like that, that's a really cool feeling. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, I mean, I had applied, had applied, it, uh, AI to, uh, energy analytics to help reduce energy, uh, energy consumption. Uh, this is like 10 or 15 years ago. And, uh, also, also worked on applying it to, uh, genomics. Uh, so, uh, using it to look at, uh, protein sequences and predict what they're going to, what the function of that protein is going to be. Uh, and so then they can use that in labs to, uh, uh, kind of more quickly find proteins that, uh, say, uh, generate certain pharmaceuticals or use, you know, find proteins that are, uh, can be used as uh, medicine. Um, and so they can do that in, in AI, in software first, as opposed to having to do all of the kind of manual experiments in, in a wet lab. Yeah. So I think there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of fun problems and, and, uh, and it's, it's really cool. Like in that case, we were able to find, uh, find proteins that nobody had found before, or like find, find out that certain proteins had functions that no one else had found before. Um, and, I knew almost nothing about pro- proteinomics or genomics, uh, you know, so it's, it's all, yeah, it's fun. It's fun to, to watch the computer solve problems that you, you, sol- you yourself can't solve. That must feel, feel pretty special. Yeah. 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 I, I enjoy that. And it's, it's similar with the, with the drone now and the robotics, uh, you know, like I was saying earlier, when you can train it uh, or put it in a, in a situation it hasn't experienced before and it doesn't do as well. Um, and then kind of, yeah, make it harder and harder. Like when we first started training the drone, uh, it had no weights attached to the bottom, uh, and it learned to fly stably doing that. Uh, and then we just slowly added basically a pendulum to the bottom with some weight, uh, and just slowly increased the weight. And it slowly learned to deal with, you know, heavier and heavier weights hanging from the bottom of it, uh, to the point now where it's, it's got like 30 pounds of, of, uh, you know, claw and cob hanging from the bottom of it. And it's, uh, and it's flying stably with that. So, uh, and, you know, none of that, that was all just like the same software. It didn't change anything. Just give it more practice, more training. I mean, I, I talk a lot about, you know, I'm a good builder because I've made loads of mistakes. How yeah. much sort of scope for uh, for the computer making mistakes is there? Yeah, there, there's a ton. I mean, like currently with the training that we're doing now, it's hanging in a harness. So it's it can't it can't crash or at least <laughs> it's still it's still figures out a way occasionally. <laughs> but uh, for the most part, it can't crash. Uh, and so that that lets it. So in the very beginning, we were literally letting it fly with random policy. So it it was taking random actions, random thrusts, uh, and you know we kind of kept it constrained a little bit, uh, but but still it was basically doing random random actions. Uh, and and then kind of as it as it you know learned more, then we kind of reduce some of those those constraints, um, and hopefully soon we'll be flying out of the harness uh, where it, where it has uh, more more opportunity to crash. Uh, but it definitely, it definitely makes, makes mistakes. 
<laughs> Good. I'm glad to see that. Yeah, my, my <laughs> primary like learning is, yep, yep. is still still true. Um, yep. Like, how um, how did you come to decide on using a drone? Yeah, we looked we looked at a bunch of different ro- robotic platforms, uh, and and the drone drone just kind of it ended, up, it ended up making the most sense. Like, we we didn't actually have experience with drones before. It's not like uh, you know, yeah, we've been been really in, into drones. There's still many people who have been into drones for you know five or ten years. Um, like I, I've never flown a drone that that's smaller than I think six feet in diameter. Yeah. You know, we also looked at, uh, rovers at gantries, cranes, uh, a lot of different, a lot of different options. And, and the issue with, with most of them is that you either end up being really big and stiff, uh, like these huge gantries, they're basically scaled up 3d printers. Uh, but in order to be precise enough in, in that, in that case, uh, you, ha- it, it's, you have to make very, very big, uh, like these gears and the and the the gantry. Like it gets very expensive very quickly to be moving precisely, uh, you know, to the millimeter across an entire build site. Uh, so so that that gets very very big to the point where you have to actually have a crane to set up your gantry. Uh, so so that's kind of one extreme. Uh, and then uh, even even on like a rover, uh, if you're reaching up to the top of the wall, you're going to end up with some really long arm. Uh, and then that arm is going to is going to like want to tip over. So you have to have some base, you know, large base to stay steady. Uh, and then so now you're big and bulky again. Uh, and so the drone just lets us uh, be kind of just as big as we need to be. We can fly anywhere on the build site that we that we can you know get to. We don't have to worry about what's in the way uh, if the if the ground is is flat or stable um, and it, they're easy to pack up. Uh, you know, it's easy to set up, tear down, fit in a box truck. Uh, so there's just, just just a lot of advantages there. And what what sort of weight is it going to be able to carry? I mean, I guess you know they're they're sort of scalable things. So if you want yep. more weight, make a bigger drone. Yeah, right now it's it's uh, the one we're flying is good for about 200 pound payload. Uh, in addition to its 50 pounds uh, that it, that it weighs, uh, but that's that's more of kind of a, a prototype uh, or like test test drone. Um, we hope to get it down to something more like 50, uh, 50 or 60 pounds. Uh, but kind of right now we're not worrying too much about the weight, uh, just making sure everything can work. Uh, and, and, uh, it just makes it easier to prototype tools. Uh, you know, we're like in some cases, literally throwing on plywood and, and, you know, blocks of blocks of two by fours and stuff, uh, in, in prototyping. So, uh, kind of get something that's works and then we can kind of scale it down and figure out how to make it lighter weight uh yeah. as, a, as a next step and i suppose uh, there'd be a question of many small things or fewer bigger things right right yeah yeah well and, and another issue that, that comes up frequently with the drone is just kind of uh energy use and intuition about like drones don't seem like they can carry very much like people see drones carrying like cameras and like even even like a pretty small camera it takes a pretty big drone to fly around mm. um they don't last very long uh, but a lot of those intuitions uh kind of get changed uh when you have a tethered drone which is what we're using uh so that it is actually connected by wire to the to a ground power supply uh and so uh you're not carrying around the batteries which is a huge weight advantage um and uh there's just uh the amount of power that you can supply from from the ground as opposed to out of a battery is just incredibly more so uh you know our the size of our drone compared to how much it can carry its capacity uh, is is kind of uh, unusual if you're used to thinking of kind of the the standard battery battery drones um, and yeah. and the energy use e- even when when we've kind of counted out doesn't end up being that much like it's it's a, a fraction of the total cost of construction um, and it's actually similar to or right now I think we're actually a bit less than like a concrete pump uh, so if you were going to try to pump a material like concrete. Uh, a, a, you know, as a, as a possible alternative, like those also use huge amounts of energy. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's not that much even compared to, to other cases. Um, and absolutely speaking in terms of, uh, the total cost for the construction, it's, it's really not that much. So that, that also is a little bit unintuitive. It seems like flying, flying things around, uh, would be inherently energy inefficient. Uh, but, but it turns out it, it it's not so bad actually. Yeah. Interesting. I like it um and so what what like what are the the sort of issues that you you know, you see as a, a thing that you've got to overcome yeah you know, are there are there things i guess where like you're waiting for drone technology to catch up till you can do a certain thing or sure sure yeah i, mean, I think i think there's 
Uh, there's this stuff that we're working on with the with the uh, impact hammer, kind of the shaping process. I think there's definitely uh, uh, so, some unknowns there. I mean, I think I've got a pretty clear idea what, where I think we should be heading, but uh, I'm sure there's going to be surprises there. Uh, and uh, you know, it'll it'll be kind of an application that that is is uh, is not kind of a standard like computer vision. Uh, like you can't just just find some some library online that already has this implemented, right? It's, it's all kind of custom new new stuff. Um, so I, I, there's certainly there's certainly some some unknowns there. Um, and then I think I think also and Danny can talk more about it, but uh, I think there's also a lot of interesting work in this on the structural side. Uh, like how do we uh, how do we reinforce it in seismic zones and and kind of doing all the the structural testing? I think there's a lot of interesting work to be done there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in, in particular with um, the current code as the uh, seismic is put in the wall is a little, uh, it makes our flight pattern difficult. So we're exploring different ways to not only like change that system, you know, make it easier to put on at the end or to retrofit a home or to make a repairable system. Currently the, the metal's treated a lot like concrete. So it is inside the wall cavity, whereas mm -hmm. our system pulls it kind of out to the skin. Um, there are a number of advantages due to that, you know, from that. Um, but the primary reason for the, Early exploration for us was just better flight patterns on site instead of having you know, little pieces of metal sticking up everywhere to your top plate. You have um, kind of a clear plate to build from. Mm -hmm. um, so I think from the technical side, that's that's a big you know problem that's uh, ongoing. Uh, yeah. and we're trying to explore this year, like as we do pilot homes, if we decide to stick to current code, how do we fly around those rods, or how do we like build them up as we go layer by layer, which introduces like different cost and, and complexity issues. So. The platform yeah. requires a, a decently clean build plate for optimal use. So we're, we're exploring how to do that while making the systems better in the long run. Yeah. Well, I guess you've written on your website that you're using Cobb Composite. And I'm intrigued to know what that means. It's Cobb. It's Cobb. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, we we're having trouble with um, the pre-associations with Adobe in, our, in the U.S. is, you know, kind of a, a zero roof line southwestern square flat roof structure so people were charged with that mm -hmm. um and then Cobb gets you know some people think of northern england um some people think of hippies yes like the yanto evans kind of oregon yeah. Cobb thing yeah so we we're trying to find like more neutral language to present it to the public so that we had less to overcome when explaining it. and that's just as much for like vcs and folks we're talking to as just the general general populace yeah. So yeah, in our case though, to speak directly, this is one of the things we got from um, from Cabbage or Cabbage. I always get it, I always say it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my English side, the wrong kind of English side. Well, um, I mean, the the Boge is is French. For that's Cobb, true. Yeah. So you know, like yeah. that's okay. We're probably both <laughs> saying it wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, we're we're close <laughs> enough. Um, one of the unique things in their mix is that they use gravel. Um, okay. Uh, kind of dust to three quarter. Mm -hmm. um, and they found that the aggregate profile makes a stronger wall assembly. So we've been using dust to quarter inch material. Uh, that's a waste product in the US, or at least a very cheap byproduct of making gravel. So our cob is, uh, is not the traditional sand clay straw. It is a, um, you know, influenced by this other university's work, gravel clay straw. So yeah. I guess if you want to say our composite differs in any way, it's that way. And that's for cost reasons, but also not drawing on for sand here is pretty much a non-renewable resource. We're taking river yes. sand if we're taking any sand. So this is an industry byproduct that's uh, friendlier to, to utilize. Nice. Is it, um, when I was in Utah, we were using, uh, it was like the leftover once they crushed up rocks for yeah. building roads. Is that yep, the same that's stuff? quarter minus. Yeah. And there yeah. are places in the U S that have, um, kind of products pre-mixed that work as cob. Um, like road base or, or um, base for parking garages. That's what a, a builder, uh, Uncle Mud, he's one of the regional builders near us, and that's what he uses. And it comes straight from the, the mixing plant, ready to go. You just put yeah. straw on it. We don't have that luxury, unfortunately. So Yes, the, the, the Utah mix was, was like, you know, add water, smear it on as plaster. It was the most glorious thing. And I never realized how spoiled I was. Until I, you know, I came back nice. back to England and was like, ah, I've got to you know, you dig up my mud here and then work out what it's missing. And I, I think that the supply chain is one of our big technical problems to solve. 
Yeah, we've been looking into, I mean, we mentioned the quarter minus there, but just how to sift the clay, how to mix its scale. Um, there was some research done here by a group called I Love Cobb about 12, 10, 12 years ago using silage mixers from the agricultural industry. Uh, mm -hmm. And we've been talking to the, the producers of those pieces of equipment. It, it seems like it's a feasible direction. And it seems like it moves the throughput up to something like, you know, six, seven tons of cob an hour uh, instead of, uh, you know, a quarter of that you might get dropping with a, with a bucket, you know, and a, yeah. a piece of equipment running over yeah. it. So, yeah, finding out that is, uh, is essential to getting to like a product, regional product that makes sense. It's interesting. You um, you said when I asked you about the the cob composite, uh, you know, that you're not doing like the more standard mix. Whereas you know in England and you know and across Europe, where cob is a, a heritage building material, there is there is no standard mix. There is you know generally the areas that have cob buildings are the ones that had like the right mud there. Yeah, and yeah. you know. There's, so there's parts of the country have got high concentrations and you know some with none at all, just purely because of you know what the ground is, and I think that's sort of the one of the wonderful things is that in any region it's going to be different. Um, like if you don't have any sand, you can chuck loads of extra fiber in it and you know kind of create a workable. You're not following a recipe from a recipe book where you must have this and this and this. Yeah. Yeah, and that definitely, that definitely helps with with kind of sustainability too. Of just not having to uh, find the exact same material in every pl place. You know, it can be. I mean, it's the, around here we can get most of the materials are actually waste products. Uh, you know, the the clay is waste product from uh, what what's on top of a, a quarry, uh, and and uh, yeah, and the quarter minus is waste product from the uh, from the the quarry industry as well. So, uh, and yeah, that that can change depending on where we are. So that that's definitely definitely an advantage. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose you're you're sort of looking at it as getting to a, a place where you can sort of send out a product and the labor or the you know the, the robots to to build it. Uh I guess the the sort of interesting thing for me would be, you know, robots are the the thing that gets sent out and then every place gets its its own unique sort of product uh as in like the mix. Yep. Yeah, and definitely that that could especially on the larger build sites uh you know, longer term, we would like to be able to use material that are on site, uh, use clay that's on site. Uh, and um, yeah, right now, right now we're thinking more, more uh, uh, having, having either like a central mixing uh, place uh, for each region. Uh, yeah. But, but eventually that, that kind of thing would definitely be possible too. We'll be back after a quick break. Hey there, I'm Mick from the Mick and Pat show. That's right. And I'm Pat looking for a podcast. That's like catching up with the old friends. Well, you're in luck. We're here to bring you weekly doses of lifestyle commentary, discuss culture and politics, and top it off with the occasional beer and film reviews. But it's not just about us. We're a community. Our listeners are our kin, and we let you all have a say in what we discuss. So saddle up and join the conversation at The Mick and Pat Show. You can check out our website or find us wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah. And the code is pretty amenable to that. Um, the The testing you have to do on any given site, those smaller tests are fairly cheap. The full scale wall testing that we're talking about for seismic stuff, that that's expensive, but you only need to do that, you know, kind of once or in a central lab. Whereas, you know, you're making just tests that can fit in your hands site to site and that's, yeah. that's you know, sufficient for code. Nice. That's good. I mean, I always found code in the States to be, I, mean, I was building sort of straw bale buildings and I found it a little bit, oh, it's different very different to how it is over here but it was quite sort of overly prescriptive and uh and sometimes it's difficult it's getting better but it's difficult yeah and i i wanted to say as well i'm very glad that uh that cob composite is is just cob i <laughs> i was sort of prepared for you to go oh yeah we just put cement in it yeah <laughs> plasticizers and cement no. yeah <laughs> all the other rubbish um yeah, nice. Have you um have you thought at all about sort of adding lime into the mix? Uh, yeah, we have some for we've investigated less adding lime to it. We've looked into that. It's been more the kind of lime finishes, mm -hmm. uh, and that's largely to reduce the the eave length on the homes. Because right now we've just been you know planning it like a three or four foot eave, which is you know 
the good hat, good boots kind of exactly, wide yeah. brim approach. Um, but yeah, lime in the mix. We've also there's a a group in in um, Barcelona exploring enzymes and things that will strengthen the cob mix. So there are some other natural you know investigations to strengthen the mix or increase the R value. And we look at that kind of stuff kind of in like a longer term window. Um, yeah. I think for this year we're pretty set on a, a fairly traditional mix. But yeah, there's I, other I, things are on the table in the future. Yeah, probably well, not plasticizers, but you know, <laughs> I. Good. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like you've got, it, does, it sounds like you don't need to complicate, uh, overcomplicate what you're doing because yeah. it sounds complicated enough to me. <laughs> we got enough headaches. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I saw some really nice uh, renderings on your, your site, um, kind of looking at different walling de- uh, sort of details, alcoves and things like that. What do you see in Cobb? kind of design wise that that's sort of exciting i think um yeah definitely the stone traditions here i mean i think we're considered the limestone capital of the world we uh yeah. most of the high-end building will come from one of the quarries in our region um you know government educational that kind of stuff um and a lot of the houses are stone because stone cutters could take it home so we have a really unique place that we live because of that stuff um mm-hmm. very little brick also a right. byproduct where the midwest is kind of a brick tradition um, but Cobb has a, has a lot of freedom. That's what's super exciting about it. You can do these built-ins that you wouldn't otherwise do. Um, the thickness of the wall has a, it feels like very valuable or very expensive, which is a strange thing to do when you're building out of earth. So it gets you in this different category of building. Then, then you're like, no, it's, it's just very affordable. Um, we've been developing a design language that, that works well with the code. So some of the byproducts of like the, um, Windows that go all the way to the ceiling, for instance, it just takes Cobb out of the wrong place for the code and puts it in the right place while creating uh, an architectural byproduct that's quite seductive. Yeah. So we're just trying to find those those bits of languages that we can pull in. Um, and then it, coming back to the, the built-ins, uh, you just end up with these architectural features that would otherwise be quite costly that feel really good. Um, and then Cobb in general is just a material uh, the psychometric chart, which is, you know, humidity, temperature, so forth that you feel inside the building. Um, Cobb is one of the greatest materials for that. You know, it, it regulates humidity and temperature. Um, Zach was doing some back of the envelope calculations the other day on, on, on uh, humidity. And it was something like our summer will charge the walls for six months of winter. You know, it's not exactly figured out yet, but it's these, these things that are very unique to having a really hydroscopic material that, you know, it holds water a really special way that make the home super comfortable with people. So I think when we're looking at the problems, it is how do we, uh, how do we meet code that kind of comes out as a base level? Cause we want this to be a large scale project and we want it to be applicable pretty much anywhere with minimal code problems. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it's starting to look at those features that we can do, the depth, the built-ins, and then the byproduct of it, you know, how do we retain all those properties that make it feel extra comfortable to a human? What is the sort of general preconception of of Cobb homes where you are? Because I know, I mean, there's certain people, well, certain people I remember in Utah were like, I'm not living in a mud house. No way, you know. Uh, Some of them I remember saying, like, we came from this and we're not going back to it. Like, there was a real stigma to it. And they only wanted, like, cement uh, because that was, you know, modern and and sort of, you know, the future. Is it? Do you, are you running into anything like that? I think. I mean, it's fairly neutral or uncharged here. Um, we are in the Midwest. We have, you know, we've had old growth before, and we've, you know, utilized most of that, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, but that turned over to a pine stick built tradition, and that's carried through. So it's probably hardwoods until you know 1900, 1925, and then switched to pine. So I don't think the negative associations are earth exist here. What we're overcoming more is, you know, the clay composite discussion we had earlier, where it's like, they're just picturing a Southwestern house. Right. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, we don't have as much to stigma to overcome. Yeah. I think the biggest fear with, with Adobe and, and Cobb and like all, all these kind of clay uh, earthen construction methods here is, uh, can they survive the rain? Can they survive the weather? They picture immediately, 
you know, Adobe in the Southwest where there is very little rain uh, and it's a desert, uh, it's very, uh, you know, hot and, and dry, uh, you know, so does it work in the rainy, cold uh, Midwest? Does it, you know, seem like why, there's kind of, I think a, a kind of an implicit assumption that uh, there's some probably good reason for Adobe not being built uh, in the Midwest. Like, why is that? Um, so yeah. I, I think that's probably the biggest, the biggest difficulty around here. I mean, if you need to just point at England. Yeah, so, that's what I was thinking that whole we, statement. Like if, <laughs> if their conception was just England, we'd be fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's generally what I, I yeah say. Like there, there is a history of other places. It's just kind of a historical accident. You know, like we had a lot of wood here, so um, there was no need to do that. But um, but yeah, there are plenty of other places in it, cold and wet and rainy that uh, mm -hmm. where there is there is a historic tradition of it. Yeah, I mean, we get more than our fair share of rain. <laughs> like looking out the window today, and it is howling it down but <laughs> what like do you see any any sort of limitations in in carb as a material yeah um the the r value is a big one yeah. um and and we've talked on on seismic a couple times so i'll let that one rest but that sounds like it's it's in a you know it, there are ways to work it though the seismic thing there are paths forward um yeah. we're trying to reduce the complications of the ones that currently exist um, and then make them again, you know, more feasible for repair in the future and so forth. Yeah. Um, our value exploration is that's a tricky one. So there are kind of three worlds of thought mixed in there that, that we've explored, uh, the cavity wall system, two earth walls, infill, uh, increasing the straw content of the wall, which is the one we're exploring now. And then, um, the caboge style dual wall system. Um, we've also looked at spraying, you know, hempcrete on the outside. That one seems prohibitively expensive, mm -hmm. but, uh, it is a problem we put a lot of effort into. Um, and that includes both the wall assembly having a higher R value and the thermal break at the bottom of it. Um, cause most of the materials that provide that thermal break are, are quite expensive. Um, so I think that's building wise is a, a, you know, one of the bigger problems we try to tackle in house. Um, looking outside of our house, uh, interfacing with subcontractors with an unfamiliar material in a market that's already under high pressure because they're aging out or have more work than they can possibly do anyway. So it's hard to convince them to come try a new thing mm -hmm. with a company that's trying their first house. Yeah. So we try to mitigate some of that risk through partnerships with builders that kind of in-house keep their subcontractors, but it is a, uh, it, it, it's a problem we acknowledge and we're working to mitigate the risk, but it is there. It's hard to find someone to come work on my house. Now I have a 1950s stick built house. Like they know what's in there. Um, but this, we don't have a lot of, uh, subcontractor time available right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, it's definitely the same over here. And, and definitely like the, the fear of the, the unknown material is, I mean, earth floors are kind of my, my thing and just the, trepidation that that some people have as to as to what they can and can't do and you know mm -hmm. like right. you know dealing with their their sort of preconceived ideas about what an earth floor could be that they have <laughs> you know right. it's it's like okay we'll start at square one again <laughs> every job start yeah. square one and explain all of this um but it's good though i mean I, I sort of make it sound like I'm annoyed, but I've, I, I think, you know, the more people I can educate, the better. Yeah. Well, the, and the, the labor shortage is sort of a, a double edged sword because on the one hand, it, it makes it harder to, to interface with the people who uh, we need to be working with uh, in the construction. But it also means that uh, from the general contractor's perspective or the developer's perspective, uh, you know, we're we're kind of replacing uh, stick framing, uh, the siding, the insulation, the drywall. Uh, so, so we're kind of simplifying the construction process from their perspective. Uh, like there's fewer different kind of trades having to come out uh, to, to, to build the walls. Um, so, so we're, people are interested in our work because of the labor shortage uh, as well. So it, it kind of, it cuts, it cuts both ways. Yeah, definitely. Um, and how, um, how do you feel? I'm sure you've thought about this a lot, uh, but how do you feel about the sort of ethics of, um, you know, replacing humans with robots. Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, one one main thing is that right now there is this labor shortage, right? So uh, yeah. there's there's a higher demand for construction than uh, than it can be supplied. Uh, so so in effect, 
by by doing more work with robots, we're we're not actually displacing people. Uh, they have as much work as they want right now. Um, mm -hmm. So kind of short term, that that is, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think I think that that's a pretty clear a clear s story. I guess longer longer term, it makes sense that uh, we want to try to lower the cost of construction, lower the cost of of housing. Uh, the way things are, especially here in the states, uh, it's just it's it's insane how how expensive uh, homes are and how expensive it is uh, just just to get by. Um, and so, like, there has to be some way that we can lower the cost of, of housing and construction. Um, so, so I think, uh, I mean, there are there are going to be some some displacements. Like, if if uh, workers have to, uh, you know, work on the roof instead of on the walls, or there's different uh, different trades uh, that that get displaced. I think, unfortunately, that there are there is going to be some of that uh, longer term, uh, whether it's us or whether it's 3D printed concrete or some other some other company. Um, but but kind of ultimately from from kind of the the bigger picture we we have to reduce the cost of housing somehow um, it's just it's a really big problem right now yeah totally have you got like an estimate of of how much a house could be right now we're looking at at uh, selling for something similar to market rate around here for a custom home uh, just kind of get uh, getting started but longer term uh, we're we kind of we have our eyes set on like fifty dollars a square foot uh, as, as kind of kind of the ultimate goal. Um, so we've got got big plans. I mean, that that includes uh, the foundation, the roof, the window, mm -hmm. you know, all the entire the entire house. Um, so that, that's kind of how we look at it. We're focusing right now on just the walls, um, but we do have plans to kind of expand into the other other parts of the construction uh, yeah, later. And even with the walls, when we're figuring out what kind of walls we should be building, uh, we're taking into account the the side effects of how does that then influence the cost of the the roof, or how does that influence the cost of the foundation? Like we're not just looking at the cost of the walls in isolation. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so fifty dollars square foot. That's that's kind of our our long term uh, target. Like if if there's a construction method that uh, we don't think we're going to be able to get to that price point with automation or in some way, uh, then we pretty much don't look at it. Like try to find some other solution to the problem. Uh, even if even if yeah, so it's okay if it's a more expensive now, but there has to be some path towards the fifty dollars a square foot house somehow. Yeah, yeah. Every yeah. every design detail looks at, you know, what we're doing the architectural detailing is every system in the house is in consideration. Yeah, you know, we focus on the walls, but we know it's you know a small portion of the solution. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, earth floors are another big chunk of the solution if you can get it to a price point that's um, beats out the other. Uh, we're already looking at working on slab on grade, so it's kind of a direct trade out in that case. Yeah. Um, but we look at both like that building cost and then longevity of the home and then operating costs over time. So it's a pretty broad picture when you bring all that stuff in. It's like, what is this? You know, what's the payoff of this house? What's the life cycle analysis? All that stuff matters greatly to the design team. Nice. Um, you were saying $50 a square foot. Uh, I, that doesn't particularly I can't think what that is per square meter. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what's what's sort of like? Yeah, is there an average? You know, average the, home the cost. Most affordable, like largest scale stick builders, might hit seventy or eighty, and that include. And then similarly for like um, manufactured homes, might be in that realm, like trailer homes, seventy eighty. Uh, a lot of the custom building solutions in in our region, you're probably starting at one seventy five, going up to two fifty three hundred. Yeah, something something in that realm. Yeah, so it's a, a sizable reduction then from. Uh... Yeah, so for for reference, the fifty dollars a square foot is about five hundred and thirty dollars per uh, square meter. Nice, um, and then um, I'm I'm kind of interested to know, just in a sort of broader sense, like what is what's the most exciting thing to you at the moment in sort of construction? I think for me, um, I look a lot at net zero. That was kind of the last like bit of my education. So whatever home solutions lead to that, I kind of always hold that as a gold standard. I like to look at Passive House a lot just in their design detailing because I haven't found other systems that are um, as intricate. And I borrow as much from those building philosophies as I can. I can't say we're building directly Passive House, but I would say if you looked at my drawings versus like what's code compliant and then what's Passive House on the other end of the spectrum, you know, our two products touch on both of those quite heavily. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I look at those design principles quite a bit. Is it is it something like Passive House? Uh, do people sort of pay attention to it much over there? 
Yeah, the buzz, buzzwords on our side of the world are definitely more in the lead. You know, lead platinum. Yeah. You know, if you if you hear that, more people are going to be familiar. But I still think that's more institutional, educational, governmental. Like those sorts of people are familiar with those. They don't, they don't cross over into houses a lot. Mm-hmm. There is a passive house U.S. chapter. I, I haven't seen them much. Um, and there's a couple other standards that, that have come out in the U.S. that might have a little bit more traction here, but um, Leeds probably the most well-known. Um, I just personally enjoy Passive House because it is, goes into each system so intricately, and that that gets my brain moving on to how to build a better home. Yeah. I mean, it's like a nerd's paradise for, for home. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. It's like, what yeah. kind of insulation can I put on my foundation? It's like, well, they're all made in Europe. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> which European one is imported somewhere in the U S and I end up talking to the only guy in Boston that imports whatever <laughs> form of high compact plastic. And, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's good, <laughs> good deep nerd conversations for, uh, for builders. Yeah, absolutely. And how about yourself, Zach? You know, getting, getting to the point where the, the building is using very, very little energy. Uh, I'm particularly interested uh, in, in some of the, uh, like active HVAC systems that can, uh, uh, you know, store either store energy overnight or uh, or use the energy overnight if it's cheaper at night, or kind of uh, really take into account the fact that the building itself can be a battery, uh, like a thermal battery and a and a um, you know humidity battery. Uh, so I think there's there's some really cool stuff coming coming down the pipe uh, in that direction. Yeah, there's but a lot a lot of the same stuff Danny was saying. Yeah, my my brain loves to chew on the physical battery. <laughs> it's like, man, what an interesting concept. Yeah. Like when I look at ice as a battery, I'm like, it's just a cold battery. But, <laughs> you know, those sorts of things keep my keep my mind going. Nice. I think we have very similar brains. <laughs> <laughs> um, nice, man. I mean, that's uh, that's kind of all I had on the, the sort of questions. Was there anything like that you you wanted to to sort of talk about specifically? I think if we were talking about one shell out further on dreamy stuff, we'd start talking about cities and all the projects that are coming forth in the world for reimagining cities and, you know, how they come together, what their materials are. Now, there's much to talk about there, but I get excited about that stuff for sure. The ones yeah. here particularly are, you know, Southwest based. So they're already kind of in the ideal place for us to be experimenting. So mm-hmm. keeping an eye on these projects and these kind of thinkers is, you know, our scale makes the most sense once we, you know, surpass 10 or 25 homes, whatever that sweet point is that when we go onto a site, the clay comes from that site, you know, anything that we aren't shipping, almost all of our cost is in shipping. So, yeah. you know, once we start being able to centralize and do bigger developments, um, the materials, price point, overall home cost, continuity, thought of project, all that stuff comes together in a way that um, is very exciting to me. Yeah. And so, so it's, it's totally exciting in, in the, in the U S the, the, a lot of the cities are, are, uh, are poorly designed, I guess. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of design around cars and, uh, uh, yeah, suburbs and all of this. And so there's really some interesting projects that are starting to try to rethink that and, and go more to some of the small town European style, mm-hmm. walkable, bikeable, um, you know, so those, it'd be, it would be great to be a part of building those kinds of projects, uh, yeah. in the future yeah we basically live in a predominantly misoriented grids which is not a good place to start when you're um designing thinking about the sun and all yeah. the things you can grab for free yes all the, those those naturally uh, occurring heat sources that are largely ignored yep yeah um i i realized one question that i didn't didn't ask uh was uh how how fast do you think a house could be built using your system i think the the first house we build will probably be uh closer to uh, a month or something i mean it depends on how big how big this the first project ends up being um but uh i mean i think i think ultimately uh we will be primarily constrained by the drying time of the of the cob lifts uh so so i i think uh i mean we can and we can do a little bit uh, about that as well uh in terms of uh, you know, putting putting either additional holes in, like adding surface area so it can dry more quickly, uh, using a dryer mix because we can we can shape it more easily with the with the power tools uh, that the, the drone would be using, um, and then also uh, 
you know, windy days tend to dry out the, the uh, material much faster and we're going to have a lot of wind uh, all the time. So, uh, oh, yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's not clear <laughs> exactly how much that's going to help the drying process, but, um, but that, that ends up being the main constraint relatively quickly. Yeah. And I suppose, you know, if you can control the drying, then adding more, more drones means, you know, quicker. Yep. So there's a heritage method up in the, the sort of on the border of England and Scotland, uh, which is called, oh, come on, brain. Don't. <laughs> uh, they call it clay dabbin uh, yep. and what they do is they do a, a small amount of cob uh, maybe like two inches and then they do a layer of uh, straw or fiber hmm. and that means that they can just keep going round and round and round and you know because the the fiber stops it all spreading outwards so so by adding that that sort of layer oh. of fiber and they they so the, the people up there call their method the fast method or just the method <laughs> and then when they look at like the the people in south england they're like oh they're building the slow method mm. i think our engineer would say it looks like the method where there's no seismic activity <laughs> <laughs> yeah quite possibly. having that many uh uh layers in your system would be uh probably a red flag for him but yeah. England, as i understand it has almost no seismic concern so yeah basically you know, stack it up and go yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think the other way to think about um, speed is we'll probably be throttled by, you know, of course, the amount we can put out in a day. But if you're doing five homes at a time with a drone, that switches the occasion because now you've put five homes up in that four week period. Yes. Um, so we're, we're throttled by how much we can lay a day. If the house isn't big enough, then we have unused machine time because it's just sitting there. Yeah. Uh, if the house is too big, then maybe we pull in two drones. So that that's another way to look at the problem is we can do X amount a day in one layer, and that layer can go across multiple houses. Yes, yeah. it's actually probably more likely that we'll build multiple houses with one drone before we build one house with multiple drones. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. It's, it sort of sounds like almost uh, if someone's building a small house, it'd be like, you know, all right, we can give you a discount garage as well because exactly. you know, yeah. it's going to be sat there doing nothing. Yep. It's yep. like, yeah, for the same price, your eight friends can also have their house yeah. <laughs> in machine time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Huge big thanks go to Danny and Zach for taking the time to talk me through their work. Uh, I think it is really, really fascinating what they're up to. Uh, I'll admit that I was initially a little dismissive of the concept. Maybe dismissive isn't the right word. Hesitant. But the more I've thought about it, the more it seems like a plausible version of the future. And I certainly think their reasoning for going about it uh, is is really honest and i think it's a good thing so i wish them all the very best i am really excited to see a house built by a drone um and i don't think the earth builders out there need to worry because i think there's always going to be a place for for your work and for your understanding of of the material um i think that's about it from me as i say uh, if this was your first episode then go and subscribe and take a look through the rest of the episodes as there will be a whole host of goodness in there for you. Otherwise, if you get a chance to share this episode as far and as wide as you can, I'd be oh so grateful. Okay, until next time, stay safe and smile at strangers. Bye-bye.